Hello nerd, so this is the last video in the week of the dark age of technology. Since during this time period humanity didn't shy away from genetic augmentations and gene engineering, and since our science during this period was so advanced, then it is no surprise that some of these genetically engineered humans still exist in the current Warhammer setting. In fact, there are few abhuman species about which we will talk about in this video that used to be and even still are essential to the survival of the Imperium. This video will be highly speculative and probably will raise few eyebrows, but that is just how I like it. One might even say that without these genetically engineered humans, the Imperium wouldn't even exist, and so because of it, I think it is time that we explore all of them. And no, we won't talk about the ones that came into existence during the Age of Strife like Ogrins. We will look at the origins of these subspecies, the essential roles they had among other humans, their hidden powers and why they truly are the miracles of gene engineering from the golden age of technology. Yet, I don't believe all of them were artificially made, but we will get into that later. So before we jump in the video, we are so close to the 10,000 mark, so please subscribe because it just helps the channel to grow. It's a massive milestone we are about to hit and I'm thankful to every one of you who takes part in achieving it. Remember to join the Discord to share your memes. And now, without further ado, let's dig in. During the Golden Age, humanity was more open-minded. In fact, we weren't afraid to alter our DNA so that we would be able to advance our society even further. It was the time of discovery and scientific progress. It wouldn't even surprise me if humanity at that time would have created an artificial race based on their own DNA and would even treat them as equals. If you don't think it is possible, then just look at Men of Iron. Yes, they are not living creatures, but they are fully self-aware sentient machines. And even with that, while some of them called us masters, they did it out of respect, not in forced servitude. And this is where we come to the Men of Stone. And I do believe I have some pretty solid points based on pure logic that can enforce my assumption that they were genetically engineered human beings, not machines. So, we all know about squats and leagues of Wotan. I strongly believe that leagues of Wotan are surviving men of stone. Now, here are the few reasons why I believe my assumptions are true. Every single individual from leagues is a clone. They are not born naturally and rely on recycling biomass to make more of themselves. Each one of them has a purpose and while they are indeed individuals, they all work towards a common goal, which is the maintenance of ancestor cores and survival of leagues. Even more so, these ancestor cores are fully sentient STCs. They might have degraded with time mentally, but still, they are artificial intelligence machines that are providing everything leagues need for survival. They have a symbiotic relationship. And not just with ancestor cores, but also with men of iron, because we know that men of iron are living among leagues of Wotan and they are treated with respect and dignity. Wotan will even go out of their way to make sure that no harm comes to these men of iron, which they call iron kin. The philosophy they practice is from the golden age and it does not discriminate, it is enlightened. And I do believe sorting intelligent beings based on if they are synthetic or flesh is just a primitive way of thinking. Just look at Necrons, yes they were flesh, but now they are immortal machines, so are they lesser for it or did they gain more power? Well, we can argue about that in a different video. But this is why for them it doesn't matter what the man is made of, either it is stone, gold or flesh, at the end of it all, they are all men, because one is a construct of metal and the other a construct of flesh, yet they both are sentient. This is the transcendence about which the AI of Spirit of Eternity spoke about, an intellectual transcendence. Also, if we look at everything through the prism of a fiction, then we know that in any universe, either it's fantasy or sci-fi, dwarfs have always been related to stone, mining, treasures, being bulky, tough, stubborn, inventing things, crazy machinery, and Wotan, check all of these boxes. They get along with Men of Iron because they understand what they are, and maybe because of it, they didn't suffer the same end the rest of humanity did.
Another subspecies of humanity that are mentioned to have existed during the golden age of technology are the men of gold. To understand them, we need to understand the meaning behind this color. Gold has many meanings, often denoting generosity and compassion, as well as being synonymous with divinity and power in many religious settings. Gold also symbolizes what is purest, most excellent, most noble, most enduring, most sought after, most ideal, and most valued in terms of human aspirations, human behavior, and human relationships. Allow me to give you a passage from 3rd edition rulebook, so we can paint this picture together. And so it was in the first age of man, the golden age. There is the emperor unseen and unheralded. He prepares the old earth for the coming of mankind, and he watches and he waits. He is joined by the first man of the golden race, fine of limb and strong of mind. Yet still the emperor is content to wait in shadow. To watch and learn from mankind, the golden race spreads across the face of old earth multiplying and establishing order and civilization on the anarchy of nature. In time, the second men of stone race appear, and in their way come many miracles and marvels of technology that strengthen the stone man's power, but are also harnessed by those of the golden race. Although physically inferior to the golden race, and not of philosophical temperament and disposition, the stone men have in them the conjurations of great artifices and mechanisms. In time, the golden race looks to the stars to expand their dominion. The stone race builds great machines of power that send both men of stone and men of gold into the ether. However, once the burgeoning race of mankind has taken its first steps into the greater cosmos, the golden race dwindles in influence through their dependence on artifices of the stone race. This golden age comes to an end, and the stone men prevail. First of all, once again, it kind of explains about Wotan, but that's not what we are discussing currently. Now, here's what I think. The men of gold are perpetuals. They had the wisdom to guide human race. They are extremely long-lived, and it's difficult to kill them. Most of them have best interest of humanity in mind, and many of them did accompany the Emperor in his quest to save humanity throughout history. It would make sense that their influence would dwindle as humanity would turn away from the wise old men and women and would look for the guidance from machines men of stone have created. It is just really hard to compete with supercomputer, and with all of the available genetic modifications and life-extending procedures, it is understandable that these immortal beings would lose their divinity because well, everyone could live extremely long lives. No one knows what happened with Men of Gold, but it is quite obvious they didn't die out. But there is one more interesting theory. For example, the Men of Gold are prototypes to the Custodes. Let's think about it for a moment, shall we? Thunder Warriors were prototype Astartes, and we can believe that he made a lot of prototypes before he managed to perfect his gene craft. The canon clearly states that the Men of Gold worked with the Emperor and he doesn't work with anything that he can't ultimately control. Maybe men of gold were custodies on a test run, who knows. But I like the idea about perpetuals better. It is well known that warp travel capabilities and even Galar fields originate from this period in our history. And while it is not outright stated, but it is fair to assume that these navigators also originated from this period of time because they existed even through the Age of Strife and before that. During and after unification wars on Terra, many navigator houses, also known as Navis Nobilite, pledged their allegiance to the Emperor, fulfilling their duties as steersmen of the Imperial Voidcrafts. In return, they gained total protection by the Emperor, political power, and unimaginable wealth. Many actually believed that the Emperor tolerated them only because of necessity, due to the fact that they were the only means with how humanity was able to travel through the warp, and he needed a makeshift solution until the humanity's webway project was completed. What truly sets them apart from any other abhuman species and humans in general is that they possess a third eye which is positioned in the middle of their foreheads. This idea is actually taken from Hinduism 
ancient Egypt, ancient Sumeria and many other ancient human civilizations and religious depictions. There are many esoteric speculations where this belief exists that humans possess a third eye, also known as the mind's eye, which is invisible yet it is positioned in the middle of the forehead. And if a person learns to open this eye, then they gain perception beyond ordinary sight. There is also a belief that the part of our brain which is called the pineal gland is the so-called third eye and this gland produces a substance called DMT and when this substance is taken orally, it induces very serious hallucinations. Only the most enlightened, wise and devoted people can open this eye and through it they gain ultimate understanding of the universe and its nature, they become one with it. Now the Warhammer universe has taken this idea and evolved it even further. Whenever a regular person would look into the warp, they would go insane because of the sheer psychic power and incomprehensibility the immaterium possesses. It is not a place of rules or logic, so in general, our minds are unable to make sense of it. The reason why navigators are so special is that this third eye allows them to look into the warp without going insane. In fact, it allows them to make sense of it and they use Astronomicon as a lighthouse to navigate it, thus their name. Essentially, without them, warp travel would be impossible because without being able to navigate it, Imperial ships would literally get stuck in it sometimes even get thrown across the galaxy and in some rare cases back and forth in time. Just look at orcs and how they do it. They make a massive wah, board space hawks, get sucked into the immaterium and with the blessing of their gods Gork and Mork, maybe they will be ejected somewhere where they can have a proper fight. Humanity just can't afford such luxury of stupidity in this case. You can also see what happens to the dark age of technology ships that don't have navigators. For example, Spirit of Eternity just jumping around time through different warp exit points hoping that it would hit the mark. And the best outcome they got was, well, 15,000 years off from where they wanted to be. Navigators usually walk around with this eye concealed and they are almost never seen in general public because they are just that important and also because they live in a way outside of the rest of humankind. Every single one of them is albino with red eyes and because navigator gene is sacred and cannot be reproduced through artificial means, then the only way how humanity can have more navigators is by breeding them. But they cannot reproduce with regular humans, only with other navigators so that the gene is not lost in the process and because of it, all of them are inbred in one way or another. Navigator houses practice strict selection and inbreeding processes to create the purest bloodlines and while there are many navigators in the Imperium, still, if compared to the number of regular humans, they aren't even a fraction of a fraction, so it is common for navigators to have children with distant cousins. Besides being able to use their third eye to find safe routes in the warp, the navigators possess a multitude of capabilities because of this eye. One such ability is called the lidless stare, when they open this eye completely and those who look into it see the untamed mind melting power of the warp, in most of the cases that is the last thing they will ever see. Also they have the power to trace other ships with warp engines because they can detect psychic emanations left by these ships. In certain cases they can create localized warp storms making other ships unable to enter the warp. This is especially useful in void battles. By staring into the void, they can detect things that normal eyes can't in close vicinity to their ships like hidden minefields and creatures. They also have the ability to weaponize their eyes power towards psychers, eroding the barrier between the psychers mind and immaterium, exposing them to pure chaos and killing them in process. On many planets navigators are considered sinister beings and children are often scared with stories about them like they are some kind of a boogeyman, that they have the evil eye and that is not actually far from the truth, because navigators can even mark people for warp entities as targets where all types of warp creatures will slowly eat away at your mind and soul and drive you into insanity. But probably the most destructive singular ability of the navigators is the Scourge of the Red Tide, where they blast their targets with the full power of the immaterium, literally melting flesh from the bone. Navigators can see psychic fields of other people and they can even see the emotions of these people and what intents they have. In actuality, most of the time they are depicted as these caring individuals and are willing to go an extra step to make sure that the crew of the ship is safe. They have the capacity to look into 
immediate future to avoid dangers, and because of their genetics they are even able to offset fatigue, similar like Astartes do, but they don't have catalepsy and node. And indeed, they can go really extended periods of time to make sure the ship traverses warp safely. Still, in the end they have to sleep, otherwise they will fall in coma for multiple days. And the last ability which I will mention is that they can protect minds of others from the Immaterium and psychic attacks. Without navigators, Imperium wouldn't even be possible. And while they have all this power and prestige, it looks like they don't really abuse it. They work in the interests of humanity and in many cases are just selfless and pure individuals. So it makes me think that indeed they are truly enlightened. But what do you think about navigators? Did the emperor during the golden age of technology had something to do with their creation? Also, what are your thoughts on men of stone and men of gold? Let me know in the comments below. Remember to join the discord server to be part of the community that loves to show off their minis. And if you enjoy my video then please leave a like and more important subscribe so I can get to that sweet sweet 10,000 mark. For you those are just few clicks but for me it means everything. Literally. I can't buy corpse starch with good wishes and prayers. The channel's members have voted for the next week's content and guess what? We will go in on Malkador, we will have a lot of voice acting, interesting bits of lore and we will expose his secrets. So spread the word, have a wonderful Friday and with that in mind, I'll see you next time. Nerd.